people with my mind Not pretty far now Just let me stretch it out a little It's just a feeling that comes when the world's at its meanest But I don't need nothing yet No, it isn't you, it's all me we're here in Brighton Electric Studios on a nice lazy Sunday afternoon. And why? Because we've got you Sector in to do a live session with us. So in this video today, what we're gonna do is take you through the complete setup of a band mic'd up for a live performance. Now we are in a studio today, mainly because we can control the sound a little bit better, but we are gonna treat this like it is a live performance. So that means we are gonna be miking everything up with the intention of all of the instruments being played at once. Of course, if you're recording a band, most of the time you'd record each instrument individually so you wouldn't have problems with bleed and other such things. They're two completely different arts, but today we're gonna be focusing on miking up for a live performance. This video has been powered by Shure Microphones, who, as you probably know, are one of the leading names in the microphone industry, and particularly in the live microphone industry. The Shure SM58 is on the stage of practically every venue in the country, with the Shure SM57 being pointed at pretty much everything behind the vocalist from amps to snares to hi-hats, it's everywhere. And once you've been to your gig and you sit down in your bedroom with your buddy to record your podcast about the gig that you've just seen, well, I guess most likely you're gonna be talking into a Shure SM7B. Wherever you look in the professional audio industry, Shure are always there. Now, without any further ado, Let's jump into it. Now, you Sector are a five-piece band. We have two guitars, we have a bass, we have synths, drums, and we have four sets of vocals. So we really have our work cut out for us today, but we like a challenge. So let's go through each instrument individually and talk about some of the techniques that we're employing and the microphones that we're using, starting with drums. So let's start with the kick. So on the kick drum, we have the Shaw Beta 52A. Now that is a large diaphragm dynamic microphone. What does that mean? It basically has a large diaphragm inside from which it collects sound, and the dynamic means it's able to handle louder and softer frequencies better than some of the other mics that we'll be discussing in the video. This microphone has been chosen because of its ability to handle high SPLs. Now, what are SPLs? Well, that stands for sound pressure level. Basically, the sound of a kick drum is a lot of energy and moves a lot of air in a very short space of time, creating a higher level of sound pressure. Now, you need a microphone that is able to withstand that sort of pressure without it kind of breaking up and peaking and distorting. The Beta 52A is perfect for that. The Beta 52A sounds great when it's placed inside the sound hole of the kick drum like we have here. Of course, if you can't do that, if the kick drum doesn't have a sound port hole like this, then obviously just getting it as close to the skin without touching it as possible is your best bet. Whoa! <laughs> Now there are many different techniques that you can use when it comes to a snare, but we're gonna go for the classic live setup, which is a dynamic microphone pointed pretty much at the area where most of the hits are going to occur. So that's normally the center of the snare drum. For this, we're going with the absolute industry standard classic, the SM57. So a couple of things to note with the positioning, try and be careful not to get too close to the area of the impact, otherwise when your drummer's going mental live at a gig there's a very high likelihood he's going to hit the mic which obviously you don't really want i mean this thing is rugged but it's not going to sound very good when they do that the ideal situation is to place it at least four inches or so away from the snare and away from the point of impact now in our setup we're just going for one microphone to keep it nice and simple but what you can do is add an additional second microphone that goes underneath and is pointed at the snares on the bottom of the snare drum. That's gonna give you a lot more of the fizz and the rattle of the snare drum, as opposed to the impact, which you're gonna get from the top. Let's look at the toms now then. 
So when it comes to toms, one of the main things that you want to look out for for the microphones that you're using is the flexibility of the microphone and the convenience of setting them up. For an average drummer, the toms aren't going to be a vital cornerstone to the sound. You still want them to sound good, but I would definitely go for something that's a bit easier if you're in a pinch. So for the rack tom, we're going with a Beta 98D that's got a gooseneck microphone head on it because that's really easy to angle and the microphone itself is very directional which is great for a live setup so you don't get as much bleed and you can kind of just point it at the tom and it does the job really well. What's nice is because they're quite small they're very easy to clip onto the actual toms themselves meaning you don't have to set up another mic stand that just gets in the way and people trip over it and just causes general havoc. On the floor tom we're employing a very similar technique we've got the clip mounted on the tom which is super easy very compact you know saves a lot of space but instead of using the 98d we've got a 181 on here that has the removable heads which is really useful so you can get different polar patterns on there for whatever you're doing makes it super versatile and we've got a cardioid pattern on here at the moment super directional prevents a lot of bleed now for the overheads they're responsible for capturing the brighter elements of the kit so that is obviously all of the symbols as well as the general detail of the drums. Because of this, you don't really need to capture any of the thud of the kick or the body of the snare. So what you want is something that is capturing the higher frequencies. Now because of that, we're going to be using small diaphragm condenser microphones. And because the kit is quite big and quite wide, we're using a stereo micing technique here to help increase the size and the body of the drums in the mix. Now when it comes to stereo micing kits, there are a lot of different techniques you can employ. You can use XY like we're using today. You can also use spaced pair, which would be kind of one, one side, one or the other, both facing directly down. There's loads of different options that have different benefits in different ways. If you want a stereo mic effectively, it's always good to use the exact same microphone so that you get an even consistent sound throughout the spectrum. For the hi-hats, we're gonna employ a similar technique to what we're using with the snare because again, it's quite a bright, harsh sound source so it suits the exact same mic and the exact same micing technique. Now we've gone to quite simple as we have with most of the kit and we're just using one mic pointed at the top of the hi-hat. However, if you wanted to capture a little bit more of darker sound from the hi-hat, you can also place a dynamic microphone underneath and capture a little bit more of that. Again, the absolute staple of a studio or a live situation is the Shure SM57. It just captures that nice, bright, punchy tone that you want to get from your hi-hats. Now, Youth Sector are an indie band, and part of indie band is having nice, bright, crisp guitar sounds. So what we want to do for that is make sure we're getting the brightest sound out of the guitar through the microphone. And the easiest way to do that is to place it nice and flush against the amp right into the center of the cone. Now an easy way to figure out where the center of the cone is, obviously at the moment it's a bit difficult because there's a mesh in front of it. Take your phone, get your torch on, and just go flush against the mesh and it will reveal the speaker inside and then you just point your microphone straight towards the cone. If you want to get a darker sound then maybe move it a little bit further away from the amp. Some cabs have a little sweet spot that the guitarist likes. If you play around and experiment you might find one that suits you but generally speaking point at the cone, get as close as you can to it so you get a much more direct sound. So this is the Singer's guitar amp. It's a Vox AC30, which compared to the Fender over there is a lot brighter of an amp. It's very much known for its top end, and we want to capture that. That's part of the Singer's sound, so we wanted to capture that. So what we're using here, as opposed to an SM57, is Shaw's Beta 57A. Now, apart from it having a bit of a more high quality housing and other little technical bits and pieces, one of the main differences between this and the SM57, which is over on the other amp, is the fact that this is much better at capturing high-end detail. As we've already mentioned, that's what we want to capture with the box, so it kind of makes sense for this amp. It's also a bit more of a narrower cardioid pattern, which means that the actual area that the mic is picking up sound from is narrower, so it helps to avoid bleed from other instruments. Again, something that we're looking for in our particular setup. Onto the bass. Now, there are a few different ways that you can capture bass sound in the studio and live. 
One way which is very tried and tested and popular for bass is using a DI or a direct input. What that does is it takes the bass sound from the head directly, avoiding the cab and just going straight into the desk. Quite often, this is a great way of getting a very direct bass sound without any kind of room or bleed going into the sound. However, you can also mic up the cab if you've got a particularly nice cab, which we do here. Now the SM7B is a very large diaphragm microphone and what that makes it good for is capturing lower end tones. That's why it's so popular with podcasters because it helps capture the lower end of people's range, which is kind of the desired sound when you're listening to people talking, especially on a podcast and things like that. However, in this application, we're pointing it straight at one of the speakers in this cab and it's gonna help us capture all the low end goodness that we want from the bass. Lastly then, let's talk about the vocals. Okay, let's talk about the backing vocals before we get to the lead vocal. However, in a live scenario, this thing is gonna do the job for anyone and everyone. Anything else is merely a convenience or a luxury, but this is the bread and butter of your live vocal sound. This is the Shure SM58. If you don't know your microphone, you probably recognize it. If you do know your microphone, then you already know what I'm about to tell you. It is the industry standard dynamic vocal microphone. It is voiced perfectly to capture all of the detail on the higher end of a voice in changing conditions from soft to loud. It avoids too much bleed. And as I've said before, it's on pretty much every stage across the world. If you were in a studio, you'd maybe want to use something like a condenser microphone that captures a bit more detail and is a bit more sensitive. However, they're a little bit more difficult to control if you can't control the environment, especially when you have loads of other instruments that can bleed into the microphone. So using a dynamic microphone that has a relatively narrow cardioid pattern works perfectly for our application because we're trying to avoid bleed and isolate into the actual voice itself. This is pretty much what we're using for the three backing vocals, but we've got a little bit of a special toy for the lead vocals, and let's show you that now. Now, as I've already said, the SM58 would do the job perfectly for every vocalist out there. However, there are some different Shure microphones that have different benefits and different uses, such as the Beta 58, which captures a little bit more detail and high end, and is a little bit more of a narrower cardioid pattern, which again helps to reduce bleed, and the other much more premium option, if you can afford it, is the thing that we have here, which is the KSM-8. Now the KSM-8 is a very nice premium option. It comes in this really nice chrome outer casing, which just makes it ultra durable, and it sorts out the proximity effect issue when you get too close to the microphone. So a lot of singers like to sing just like this, However, what that can sometimes do is increase the bass frequency response of the microphone when you're too close. This microphone addresses that and helps to reduce that, meaning that whether you're here or here in the microphone, I mean, you're not really gonna hear that because I'm, this isn't on, <laughs> but if you were to hear that, you would hear that there isn't as much bass frequency response when I go lower than when I go further away, which is great for live vocalists who are singing straight into the microphone. Now that's pretty much it for the microphones. However, before we go, just at the end here, let's talk about how we're gonna be monitoring, which is how everyone is gonna be hearing themselves back. And for this, we're gonna be using IEMs. Now normally the monitoring live in a venue that goes back to the band is via floor monitors, which are just speakers on the floor that are pumping back the desired mix from the desk to the different band members. Now this can cause a lot of issues with bleed and the sound can be quite inconsistent going from venue to venue. So a good thing to have is your own in-ear monitoring system that helps you to control the sound that you hear in your ears from when you're going on a tour, for example, going venue to venue where the sound will change and the monitoring available to you might not be as good in one place as it is to another. Pretty much every professional live band at a serious level is using these. So the sooner your band gets into it and gets used to it, the better your sound will be to you on stage, the more comfortable you'll be playing and the tighter your band will sound 
as a result. We're using the Shure PSM300 system today with the P3RA receivers, and we're using the Shure SE215 headphones that wrap around the ears and just get out of the way and are super convenient. So that's how we've set up in here today, and this is how it sounds. with my mind Not pretty far now Just let me stretch it out a little It's just a feeling that comes when the world's at its meanest But I don't need nothing yet No, it isn't you, it's all me And it's my head, it's my thoughts I should've paid attention I should've told the lion The sun shine When the world is dark and it's dirty My flat side is cleanest But I don't need nothing yet There's no excuses So you'll see it's boots off in this house At this house There is no good news The bad news is that there is no good news All the bad news is there is no good news Well, I try to do further your night's out And hope turn the lights out of it And there you have it. That is miking up an entire band in one video. If you want to hear more from Youth Sector, from their session that they did for us today, then we'll be releasing the full video on our YouTube somewhere down the line. So keep your eyes peeled if you want to hear how all their different tunes sounded. Thanks again to Shaw, who were kind enough to provide us with all the mics that we used here today. I will pop links to everything that we've used down in the description below. And I'll also pop a link to Shaw's page on our website, so you can check out all of the different mics that they have, as well as the ones that we've used. So what's your top tip for miking up a band? What have we missed? Let us know down in the comments below. Thank you so much for watching. If you enjoyed the video, hit the like button, subscribe to see more things like this, and we will see you very soon.